All right, so at the end of chapter 25, the dogs are chanting. Do you remember what their chant was? Hey, go back to page 154. You can look back at the text, and they were saying, Wreck Westminster. Wreck Westminster. Wreck Westminster. Wreck Westminster. There you go. You got it. All right. So they're ready to go wreck Westminster. Now, do you guys know anything about the Westminster Dog Show? You may or may not have seen it on TV. They normally show it. It's usually, it's at Madison Square Garden, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Big, gigantic assembly hall, a uh, place where they play sporting events and, like, concerts and stuff. And so they have all these fancy, like, the best of the best dogs are there. And the owners have the dog on a little leash, and they run them, parade them around, and they run with their dogs. And then they put them up maybe on a little table, or maybe that's a big dog, and they leave them standing. The dogs are, like, standing perfectly, and they don't move. And the judges go over and they check their jowls and they check their tails and they look at their spine, make sure they're like the perfect looking dog. And all of that is so that whichever dog wins best of the breed, they win breeding rights. Like they can have more dog puppies uh, that then you could sell for thousands and thousands of dollars. How much is Sam worth at the start of the story? Do you remember? $125,000. You're close. It was $180,000. Why would a dog be worth so much? Because those types of dogs, um, they can then make more of that breed. So he's got that doodlet's tooth, as I called it. And so it makes him worth lots of money. So all these dogs are worth thousands of dollars. And they're all vying for that best in show. And Cassius is like the poster boy. Literally, he's on the poster of the Westminster Dog Show. Lots of fancy schmancy dogs, all different breeds, all different colors and fur types, and they're all prettied up for the biggest show of the year. Yeah. Dog, speaking of dog shows, last night I was watching TV, and I was watching this dog show, and they would um, do their makeup on their dogs, and they would walk them out, and I like this one. They made this little chihuahua look like a skunk. Yeah, that's funny. Um, so this is a big industry, especially like people make lots of money being like professional <coughs> haircutters for dogs. I had a good friend growing up in high school. He had two poodles. They were white poodles, standard poodles. So they were like, not the little tiny ones, but like the standard size big ones. And uh, they were show dogs. They were poodles that they would take to dog shows. They won a bunch of ribbons and all that. And they're nothing like Cassius. Poodles are super smart dogs. Um, but his poodle, I can't even remember the one's name. But anytime I'd walk in and I'd go to, like, say hi to the dog, the dog would pee every time. Like, you're like, oh, hey, puppy. And like, pee everywhere. It's like, dude, you keep peeing in the house, man. Every, anytime it got startled or um, excited, it would just pee everywhere. I don't know if I want a dog that pees every time it gets excited. Moving on, chapter 26. The name of this chapter is Flyer. If Mr. Flemmy Koo, Mr. Flemmy Croup, the sole administrator, caretaker, and poop scooper of the National Dog Depository for the past 46 years, had been just five minutes earlier in waking up the next morning, if he had been just one mile per hour faster in walking to work, if he had been only slightly less patient with feeding the squirrels in the freight yard that morning and had chuckled and had chucked the whole stale baguette to them instead of breaking it up into pieces, then he might have actually stumbled into the dog escaping, a dog escapees dashing out the front door 10 minutes before dawn, and he would have stopped the Grand Enterprise cold right there, leaving this book without an ending. But he was not, and he did not, and it has not. Mr. Croup arrived, as always, at three minutes after dawn and found the front door wide open of the, in the dreadful building, wholly absent of its seven permanent occupants. After wandering around tidying up, he then did what he'd never done those 46 years. He took the day off. He went home for a bubble bath in which he pondered in bubbly relish, in bubbly relish the thought that whatever sort of day his former depositees were about to experience, Whatever trouble, mischief, or harrowing, harrowing mayhem they were about to wander into, it would, without a doubt, be the best day of their lonely, miserable lives. He was right. The dawn broke in a sky clearing of the previous night's storm clouds. The Manhattan Flyers sped southward toward New York City, 
with nine freeloading passengers atop its streamlined engine. What's the Manhattan Flyer? Isn't it a bus? Close. Maybe. Train? I think that might make sense, too. The Manhattan Flyer sped southward toward New York City with nine freeloading passengers atop its streamlined engine. So I'm assuming it's a train. They dropped from the trestle stretching over the rails back in Vermont after the engineer had slowed on spying what appeared to be a cowboy wearing a tutu sitting on the tracks reading a newspaper. Upon inspection, the trainman found it to be an old smashed door mannequin propped up with sticks dressed in folds of pink wall insulation and a discarded straw hat. He continued southward, but now with a commando squad of unwanted mutts sitting directly above his head. Soon, the steel pinnacles of New York City appeared on the bright, brightening horizon. Most of the dogs were rehearsing their elaborate plan that Sam had explained to them the night before, but they also stole excited glances at the world speeding by them that they had simply never even known existed. Freshly woken, Sam lay on his back next to the roaring diesel exhaust, absorbing the warmth, looking at the clearing sky, thinking about what he had to do. Peaches stared down at him. Sammy. Sammy, I heard you sneezing there in your nappy. But it weren't sneezes you were blurting out, but a name. Cassius. 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 Sam shrugged. This, this Cassius chap. He's up ahead somewhere, ain't he? He's up with his old things about, I'm thinking. Sam didn't say anything. It won't be a kiss you'll be giving you, Cassius, will it? Science. Silence. Oh, lad, it's a bad thing you got in mind. It would, I wouldn't be saying this if we weren't such lifelong mates. I think you're using those poor blokes. Peaches looked at the other dogs farther back on the engine, pointing out the sights speeding by. They had nothing. Now they have a purpose, said Sam, stretching. Aye, purpose and pooches, sighed the, old, the odd dog. Oh, not much to that. They're not designed to catch a mouse. They're not meant to be bringing down a galloping wildebeest, wildebleeding beast. Don't round up cows and sheep and pick up logs with their nose, he spat. There's only one thing we silly slobbering fur bags have put on this earth to do. Peaches moved in to Sam and pointed the lights of the Manhattan pointed out the lights of Manhattan ahead. Hey, this ain't it, lad. Sam looked at him and said nothing. He turned and moved to the front edge of the roaring engine and raised himself on his rear legs, both bone and steel, his body upright like a sail, leaning forward, ears flowing backward into the morning's rising sun. The dachshund closed his eyes, his front paws pushed wide with the rushing wind as if to embrace the sparkling city that, spread, that sped closer and destiny darker than the other dogs suspected. Storm's over, said. <laughs> Not yet, said the little smut quietly. Chapter 27. It's a short one. Quack, midnight, New York City, two days before the big dog show. Eldon P. Little, the night watchman for Madison Square Garden, was dozing on the arena's roof in a lawn chair, as he always did on a balmy summer New York night. But it was quite breezy, and the sound of the wind through the decorative palm trees lining the roof's round edge, woke Eldon just in time for him to see Jeeves coming in to be into view. There's a picture of Jeeves. Remember, Jeeves has those big jowls. Eldon noted that Jeeves wasn't a particularly beautiful dog, not like the ones that came every year and were due the next morning to prance around the arena far below him. This dog's jowls, for instance, were extraordinarily enormous and inflated like a flapping beach towel in the wind. Floated the animal 12 feet from Eldon's stupefied face, 200 feet above the ground. A string wrapped around Jeeves' chest disappeared down toward the street, presumably, thought Eldon, to a gang of dog-flying terrorists in the parking lot. Startled into petrified inaction, Eldon watched as Jeeves drifted on the breeze like a slobbering kite, scanning the items on the roof with the help of sharp eyes and a full moon. Jeeves noted three things as he floated. A huge water tank on stilts, several palm trees and large wooden dirt planters, and a very large roof skyline over the center of the arena below. Jeeves motioned to be pulled back down. As the hound dog descended, Jeeves happily happened to look over at the security guard, Eldon P. Little, and, giddy with the excitement of a newly purposeful life, 
did something that would cause the poor man to quit at the end of his shift. He flapped his wings and quack, quack, 